Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the STEM Equity Evaluation Portal. I'm Dr. Isabel Kingsley, and I'm the Research Associate at the Australian Government's Office of the Women in STEM Ambassador. I'm joining you today from the beautiful UNSW Sydney office in Kensington. I would like to acknowledge the Bedigal people uh, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend uh, that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. I also want to note that this session is being recorded um, and will be made available on the Women in STEM Ambassador website later on. Now, we're here today to launch the STEM Equity Evaluation Portal. Now, we know that Australia has hundreds of programs uh, that address the um, underrepresentation of girls, women, non-binary, and underrepresented groups in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, these programs tackle all the barriers that these groups face, but do they work? Well, it's really hard to say because many programs are not evaluated and evaluation findings are rarely shared publicly. So that's why the Office of the Women in STEM Ambassador created the STEM Equity Evaluation Portal to make evaluation of equity programs easy and a place to share those findings for everyone on a national repository. Now, I had the absolute pleasure of leading the development of the STEM Equity Evaluation Portal, which is an extension of the National Evaluation Guide that I wrote a couple of years ago. Now, just after publishing the guide, I had this idea, and so I rolled out my par parchment paper and pulled out my post-it notes, and um, I drew up this idea of an interactive digital version of the guide that would make evaluation and sharing evaluations absolutely as easy as possible. And with funding from the uh, Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science and Resources and a lot of work from a lot of people, we turned that parchment paper idea into a reality. So today we're going to hear from some key Australian leaders driving change towards equity in STEM. First, we're going to hear a few words from the Australian government's ambassador, women in STEM ambassador, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith herself. Then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Uh, the Honorable Ed Husick, Minister for Industry and Science. We will hear from uh, Chief Executive uh, Wafa, or, sorry, Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science, Anna Maria Arabia, and Chief Executive of Science in Australia, Gender Equity, or as we know it, um, SAGE, uh, Wafa El Adami. Then I will show you, um, uh, I will show you, show you the portal and give you a little tour and a short demonstration. And finally, um, we'll end today's session with a, a short Q&A. So if you have any questions during the session, please pop them into the chat and we will get to them at the end. Now, I would like to welcome the Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I first want to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which I'm joining you today uh, from Muanina country, the Muanina people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, it's my job to increase the participation of women and girls in STEM across Australia, not a small task. Um, but I was proud to see the recent government figures from the STEM equity monitor showing that the number of women in STEM qualified workforce has increased by 34 percent between 2018 and 2021. Now, that's a huge achievement for all of us who work on this problem. But we do know that there's still a great many barriers that remain to women, non-binary people, and others who, uh, who experience discrimination um, from entering and thriving in the STEM workforce. So today, I am absolutely thrilled to be here at the launch 
of the STEM equity evaluation portal. Um, and this is a culmination of, of several years of work um, led by Dr. Isabel Kingsley, um, our research associate who is um, going to do a great job today of explaining everything around the portal. Now, the other speakers and Isabel will describe why evaluations are so important and talk about the portal and how to use it. But so I, I don't want to cover too much of that. Instead, I just want to talk about the vision behind the portal. What's the big picture? Now, firstly, I want all STEM equity programs in Australia to use this portal um, so that we can build a complete picture of all of these activities across Australia and, and sense check what we're doing, how we're spending our time and resources and to identify gaps. Now, this will hopefully drive a culture of openness and of self-reflection so that we can try different things and we can embrace changes to our own activities uh, where appropriate. I also want the portal to be, I guess, a place of connection, a place that people come for inspiration um, so that people come and browse the portal to get new ideas, to learn from others, and also to reach out and collaborate across the country. And finally, I want the portal to be a place where funders mingle with program owners, people who run the programs, and looking for opportunities to invest and link up with you all um, to hopefully scale up successful programs, uh, both internationally and nationally, of course. So as well as evaluating the many outreach programs that aim to build Australia's STEM pipeline, we're really, really keen for also for organisations to share their workplace change and workplace change initiatives, um, which I believe are really key to improving the experiences of women um, and in STEM and fixing our chronic attrition rates. Um, and this is one of the key problems um, in the STEM pipeline. So we know that workplace change is hard. It's very, very difficult. But if we build this culture of transparency and encourage people to try something different, uh, I believe we can turn Australia into a world leader in workplace gender equity. So please sign up to the portal, create an evaluation for your program or get the inspiration to create a new program and make it public. So our next step in this journey uh, is early next year, which will be to create a guide to how to implement workplace change programs. So look out for that around March next year. Now, I really just want to extend a sincere thank you to all my team and congratulations to everyone, uh, both past and present members of the Women in STEM Ambassador team. Thank you to all of you as well for engaging in this hopefully game changing initiative. So I'd like to now um, pass on to a video uh, and a few words from the Honourable Ed Husick MP, Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Hi everyone, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking to you from today, the Ngunnawal people in Canberra. And as we consider the human aspects of technology, it's worth reflecting on the role that knowledge and science played in First Nations societies before colonisation and how First Nations people have retained custodianship of that knowledge against great odds and facing great hardship. We owe them a debt of gratitude and I'd like to pay my respects to any First Nations people in the audience today. To meet the challenges of the future and maximise the nation's potential in STEM, we've got to ensure that all people feel they can access and belong in STEM education, careers and industries. And for this to happen, we've got to break down the cultural and structural barriers preventing Australians from diverse backgrounds entering and flourishing in STEM careers. Currently, there are hundreds of programs dedicated to promoting equity in STEM across Australia. Multiple organisations are investing time and resources into these programs. and We want these programs to work, which is why the evaluation tools like the Women in STEM Ambassadors National Evaluation Guide for STEM equity programs are so helpful. And I'm pleased that this is now being turned into an interactive online portal for organisations to evaluate STEM equity programs for themselves. And this will promote best practice within the STEM community. And it'll offer a repository of publicly available program evaluations, allowing organisations to review other equity programs and learn what works, what doesn't. The insights that come from this work will be invaluable in forming future directions for programs that aim to widen the pipeline of Australian talent into STEM careers and it's perfect timing as the government establishes an independent review into diversity in STEM 
to ensure our own programs can be as effective as they can be. And together, the work we're doing will contribute to increasing the number of STEM skilled Australians and support our goal of achieving 1.2 million technology related jobs by 2030. Thank you and congratulations on this achievement. Thank you, Minister. Our next speaker is Anna Maria Arabia. She is Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science. Anna Maria has over 20 years of experience in the science sector. She's led significant reform on, um, in global science engagement, in science policy matters, and in addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion in science. Uh, Anna Maria led the development of the Women in STEM Decadal Plan, which is the roadmap that guides and underpins everything that, that we do at our office and um, leads us to, um, towards that gender equity in STEM that, um, by, by 2030. So we are very pleased to welcome Anna Maria. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Isabel, um, and thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity to be here today and for joining us. Um, special thanks to you, Lisa, and all of your team for your leadership. Um, as you know, I have great admiration of your work and I can't commend you enough on the rigour you have brought to women in STEM activities and the systems approach you have taken. It is a game changer and it's the exact sort of change that we need to move for. So thank you. I'm joining you from Ngunnawal land, and I too wish to acknowledge the traditional owners and their elders, the present and emerging, whose land it always was and always will be. Uh, we all have much to gain by establishing a First Nations voice in this institution, and in doing, so, in doing so, we have an opportunity to embed respect, equity and inclusion into the Australian identity. It's time we move up together. Uh, as Lisa mentioned and uh, Isabel too, the development of the STEM equity evaluation portal was a key recommendation within the Women in STEM Decadal Plan. And many of you um, will have been involved in the development of that plan and you'll recall in 2019, the Australian Academy of Science, um, together with ATSI, uh, published the Women in STEM Decadal Plan. Um, it was the first time that government, academia, industry, the education sector and the community came together to collectively shape a framework and pay the way forward so we could seek to achieve gender equity in STEM uh, by 2030. And it was and remains a shared vision for the future, and that's to attract, retain and progress girls and women in STEM. A and to achieve this vision, the 10-year plan absolutely demands leadership, accountability and commitment um, from everybody, but especially from the STEM sector in addressing gender equity issues and in creating an inclusive, representative and accessible STEM environment. There were hundreds of consultations undertaken, interviews, roundtables, discussions. The literature was thoroughly synthesised. Sub submissions were received from far and wide. And from this emerged six key opportunities, of which I'll focus on two today. One was around leadership and cohesion and the second on evaluation. And that's the one I'll focus on. Um, of course, each of those six opportunities are important, as are all the actions taken to achieve its vision. But without evaluation of our activities, it's almost impossible to determine which initiatives are effective, which should be extended or scaled up and which should be stopped. In other words, underpinning the success of all of the opportunities in the decadal plan is the need to evaluate. Without it, we act blindly and we cannot take an evidence informed approach. At the time of the publication of the Decadal Plan, we found that of the 330 gender equity initiatives uh, that we were able to identify, only three had publicly available evaluation findings. We had been acting blindly. And yet the need to get this right, to harness and value all of the available talent across our nation, is greater than ever before. The demand for, for a STEM skill workforce uh, to power our industries uh, and our economy is escalating and showing absolutely no signs of slowing down. And the need remains to dismantle the myriad systemic barriers and, cult and cultures faced by women and girls, uh, which result in their underrepresentation across the depth and breadth of STEM disciplines and careers. 
underrepresentation and underutilisation of the workforce are threats to Australia's prosperity. I've heard this time and time again, especially most recently. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. Our stated aspiration in 2019 was that Australia lead the world in the use of evidenced informed activities and policy settings to support a diverse and inclusive STEM ecosystem. But as I said earlier in 2019, the majority of gender equity programs in STEM lacked useful performance data and formal evaluation. Not only was an evaluation framework needed, which now exists thanks to the work of Lisa and her whole team, it was um, created in 2020, but so was leadership from the government and other funders by requiring adoption of it as a condition of funding. Today, if you apply for a Women in STEM grant offered by the Australian government, you are required to develop an evaluation framework as a condition of funding. This sort of systemic change must be applauded and applauded loudly. It represents a paradigm shift in the culture of evaluation and we know it works. The benefits of embedding evaluation have been abundantly demonstrated in activities and national programs such as SAGE and we'll hear more from what for a moment. Um, but I remember SAGE way back in its pilot phase demonstrated how valuable taking an evidence-informed data-driven approach was. And today we know evaluation is at the core of this successful accreditation framework which is utilised by some 43 SAGE members across the higher education and research sector. Practices such as this directly enable activities to be measured, to be refined and improved based on evaluation data, and they have led to positive systemic changes that remain embedded across the sector for the long term. Building on this today, we so warmly welcome the STEM Equity Evaluation Portal. It's a place where you can find tools to support your equity actions and a repository of evaluations of activities undertaken by us. It builds on the fundamental work of Lisa and her team who developed the National Evaluation Guide that allows you to create an evaluation plan for your gender equity activities and report on findings. Lisa, I don't know about you, but when I look at all three of the recommendations in the evaluation opportunity in the Women in STEM Decadal Plan, all three in that section are done. One, co-design a national evaluation framework that enables project level evaluation, done. Two, organisations such as government should support evaluation as part of funding, done. It now needs to go to every other government department, but we'll get there. Three, <laughs> programs should be published and collated, including evaluation data in a national repository su supported by government to inform decision making about what works and what should be scaled up or funded across it. Done. Tick, tick, tick. If we were in a live launch today, we'd be pausing, possibly even standing to applaud. So I think we, we should um, give a virtual applause for those three extraordinary achievements. Um, the evaluation practice and data in the STEM equity portal provides such rich assets to inform works to attract, retain and progress girls and women. And importantly, both the National Evaluation Guide and the portal create a culture of evidence-informed practice and allow us to compare apples with apples. Evaluation data ac across projects is most useful when it's comparable. And of course, developing this culture of evaluation is not just collecting data, it has to be published. You need the transparency piece. Transparency does not mean hanging dirty washing on the line when programs don't have the desired impact. Rather, it informs our future and stops ongoing spending on activities that do not have a measurable impact and may not achieve the desired gender equity goals. And it enables that funding to be redirected elsewhere. Public reporting evaluation data helps us improve awareness of actions that do work. It helps us find gaps so we know what else needs to be done and what can be done. And it allows like-minded organisations to forge collaborations so that we can amplify our progress. 2030 is approaching way too fast. The research informing the Women in STEM Decadal Plan showed us that the lack of cohesion and the small scale programs were major barriers to achieving better outcomes for girls and women in STEM. We've been spread too thin, compromised impact and missed opportunities to work together. 
but I'm so pleased and so proud that the National Evaluation Guide and the portal give us the tools to do things differently and to move forward in an evidence-informed way. Can I please extend my congratulations to Lisa, Isabel and your entire team for this remarkable achievement, for your leadership, your commitment and your ability uh, to bring about uh, systemic and sustained change to improve the lives and lives of girls and men. Thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, for your kind words. Um, that, that means a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Wafa Eladami. She is the Chief Executive of Science in Australia Gender Equity Limited, or as many of us know it, SAGE. Now, Wafa led the successful implementation of the SAGE pilot over four years and oversaw its expansion and its um, recent incorporation into a non-for-profit company. So congratulations, Wafa, and welcome. Thank you very, very much. And uh, really, um, I would like to echo and extend my acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the lands from where I join you today. I'm today on Ewan Nation on the south coast of New South Wales. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also extend my acknowledgement and respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us at this event and across Australia. It is really great pleasure to be with you here, particularly at this launch. And I thank and I extend my congratulations, echoing Anna Maria's um, wise words and generous words to the Women in STEM Ambassador, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, to you, Isabel, and to the entire team. Your work over the last few years, your support for SAGE, but importantly, this particular achievement of producing the evaluation portal is terrific um, and really quite timely. It is an important tool um, and we will no doubt benefit from it both in supporting SAGE but also our accredited institutions and it will continue to deliver a transformative change and guide transformative change locally, nationally as well as internationally. So Australia is really demonstrating uh, strong leadership in this space as it has done so with SAGE and driving other countries to you know, adapt to the approach. Um, what I will do today is talk a little bit about the uh, SAGE experience and insights, particularly in the context of why evaluation is important. You've heard um, from Anna Maria how that has been really embedded right into the very beginning uh, of SAGE during the pilot. Um, but more importantly, really how transformative systems like SAGE are really important. Uh, particularly with the inherent characteristics that make them so effective and successful as systems approaches. They firstly apply a systematic and iterative scientific approach, relying on the data, the evidence and root cause analysis methodology to help us understand the what and the why of barriers, inequities or issues. And importantly, then help facilitate how we design and improve um, on these inequities and remove them from workplaces or any other um, environments or settings. I think the most um, important aspect as well, and the second complementary characteristic is that systemic um, and transformative systems integrate evaluation and measurement of outcomes and impact right at the outset but they importantly underpin um, this approach by robust governance and transparency. What that means is that you've got accountability embedded right through the whole journey um, to transformation and to change. So um, from the very beginning of the SAGE initiative as a pilot and ongoing evaluations were always planned and actioned and the program continues to be regularly evaluated. What the evaluations have really helped us with um, are reflected in the so many improvements. Um, first and foremost, they continue to assure that SAGE accreditation is and remains fit for purpose for Australia. It is responsive to the sector's needs and it achieves the program's objectives. It would not have helped us if we were to pick up a penis one as it is, which is the core element of SAGE accreditation from the UK and just deliver it here as it was delivered in the UK in its own structure, in its own approach. It has also informed us in continuously improving the rigor of the SAGE accreditation. 
whilst continuing to reduce its complexity and administrative burden. It's been invaluable in informing good practices for measuring outcomes and impact, particularly for gender equity, diversity and inclusion. And equally importantly, it is guiding the design of a sustainable data-driven systems approach that is going to continue to deliver practical, effective and transformat transformational change for the sector. I think one of the most insightful experiences and learnings from SAGE is that evaluation of SAGE um, has not only served its purposes to be the most powerful diagnostic and change-making tool for gender equity, diversity and inclusion, but by using SAGE accreditation, institutions have also greatly improved their own understanding of the inequities and the barriers that exist in their workplaces, whether it's at the recruitment, at the retention or the progression or across the culture itself. This in turn has really helped them in designing better actions so they are able to remove and or reduce the inequities and the barriers within their organizations. Equally by integrating evaluation into the SAGE approach, institutions are also better equipped to define the outcomes and the impact measures for the suite of actions they have designed and are implementing. We've learned a good lesson. If you set out to implement a policy, a program or initiative, you need to really think about um, the outcomes and the objectives and what are the suitable measures or metrics you're going to evaluate that with. Now, I think what we've heard from Anna Maria and what we've heard the vision from Lisa today, these are exactly the important elements about making sure that interventions for gender equity, diversity and inclusion really serve the Australian community and our workforce. So by doing this approach, you're able to better monitor and better measure the outcomes and impact. And these actions themselves can really help glean insight why they work, why are they effective, but also learning why are they not effective and how to improve them. One of the other valuable and important aspects of the evaluation in the context of SAGE accreditation, and this was also identified in the Women in STEM Decadal Plan, is the inter integration of an intersectional approach. Both Anna Maria and Lisa spoke earlier, um, touching on this point. Um, intersectionality and intersectional approaches are absolutely fundamental in equity, diversity and inclusion work, and particularly for improving the workforce itself. They are also actually quite important in many other applications, um, healthcare, consumer products, all really do this well. If you don't release a product on the market or you can't serve a particular population with um, important diseases and conditions without understanding the intersecting factors that really affect their health or health outcomes. So if we don't acknowledge and understand within group differences, an initiative that is aimed at women, for example, only addresses the needs of some women. The evidence for this is strong. For example, recent work by Professor Michelle Ryan of the Global Institute of Women's Leadership found that black women wanted EDI initiatives that explicitly incorporate intersectional differences. Asian women, on the other hand, wanted ways to deal with other challenging their authorities. White women were concerned about being seen as too assertive or not assertive enough. But when you look at what is happening in interventions, most organization um, gender equity initiatives focused on networking, work-life balance, and helping women to be more confident or assertive, suggesting that the existing initiatives or interventions don't necessarily serve the needs of Black and Asian women very well. And more and more, we're seeing mounting evidence of the importance of taking an intersectional approach to how we understand and evaluate programs and initiatives, but also how we design and co-design solutions to serve different communities and different groups within communities. So as we've heard from both um, Lisa and Anna Maria, it is evident from the SAGE experience that the more evidence we have about what actions work, why they work and how, the better we are informed on translating them across different settings and then more rapidly we can achieve gender equity by investing in the right interventions or indeed in fine tuning interventions based on such learnings. But enabling this requires the transparency and access to the evidence base. We know, for example, that SAGE contributes um, by publishing accreditation applications and evaluations of institutional gender equity. And that's a credit to the community that right at the outset um, demonstrated leadership 
including through the leadership of the academies that founded SAGE, that all of that evidence will be published, will be made available, irrespective of the outcomes of accreditation. And this really brings me to the value of the evaluation portal, which by its design embeds evaluations, delivers an invaluable, accessible, and importantly, an evaluated set of resources. I see it like clinical trial registries in medicine. The portal has the power now to act as an evidence bank where organizations, practitioners, and change managers can certainly access solutions, can learn from existing practices, can collaborate with each other, and thus can amplify the collective impact we all input towards. So to close and bring this all together, the combination of evaluation, data-driven insight, and transparency is powerful, um, much as the portal will be powerful, because what they will deliver is that they will reveal in rich detail the barriers and the issues that face gender equity, diversity and inclusion in organization, uh, whether they are at a local level or whether they are commonly shared across organizations. They will also help inform the design of targeted as well as context specific actions and also importantly, common solutions that can be concurrently implemented across the whole of the system. They codify the learnings um, and they can guide improvements. Um, they will facilitate and encourage the knowledge sharing, um, the vision of Lisa and the vision of Anna Maria and the vision of the government and all of us. Um, and so we are able to knowledge share and also translate that knowledge. But furthermore, I think one of the most powerful outcomes will be is that consolidating the evidence in this registry-like portal has the power to mobilize engagement and empower individuals who are in workplaces to be partners in the improvements. So congratulations, Lisa, congratulations, Isabel, and also congratulations to the leadership of the academies um, on you know, putting out uh, the decadal plan and putting that map for us moving forward. Um, SAGE has been capably and ably supported by Lisa, by Anna Maria, by Isabel, and um, we have collectively really seen the advantages of the work of the Women in STEM Ambassador and her advocacy and her office's support throughout. So thank you so very much and congratulations um, on this achievement. Thank you very much, Wafa. Okay, it is now time to share with you this STEM equity evaluation portal. We've made you wait for 30 minutes. <laughs> Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science and Resources for funding this project. I want to also thank everyone who's been involved in this project, including those who contributed feedback in the public consultation that we ran late last year, and our friends from various organizations who tested the portal last month to make sure that it's ready for you today. And last but certainly not least, I want to say a huge thank you to our teammates and our new friends at ASG who worked on the development of the portal and brought our ideas to reality. I specifically want to thank the development team, these four wonderful people that you see right now. Arjun kept everything on track and ticking smoothly. Tony took my wild and messy ideas and created the, the engine behind the portal. Um, Mark worked his magic and created a really user-friendly portal machine. And Christina test drove it and made sure that all the parts are working smoothly. The team worked tirelessly um, over late nights and weekends and holidays and even through a natural disaster. Their dedication to this project is really moving and admirable. So thank you, team. Now, let's take a look at the portal. All right, welcome to the evaluation portal. So you can see the portal here has two main features to search and discover programs and evaluations and to evaluate your own equity programs. So you can access these two features here on these buttons or also um, at the top in the menu bar. So let's go to search 
programs. So here you can search programs and evaluations. We currently only have two programs, our own, as examples here. So to search, you just type the relevant search words in the search bar, for example, STEM, and the relevant program appears. In this case, evaluation of our own office. You can filter using the available options. For example, you can filter by audience type and the evaluations containing those audiences will appear. So um, in this case, again, it will be um, the Women in STEM Ambassador uh, initiatives. Then you can bookmark or you can view your search results. Um, here you can see the program description, the audiences, the outcomes of the program, the intended outcomes indicators. If you want more detail, you can go in and read the full evaluation and everything is there for you to view, all of the details. Um, you can also connect with the people running a program by contacting them via email by clicking on the uh, contact us button right under their profile photo. Now, the next feature is to evaluate your own program. So you just come up and click on the top menu item here. Now, this page contains all the information you need about evaluation basics. So um, the benefits of evaluating and publishing, um, how to use the portal, uh, and also we have some examples here. Um, I always say, see one, do one. It's always easier to work off an example. To start evaluating your program, you just click here. Um, you need to create a user profile. I already have one, so I will just log in. Now here you have all your details. When you create your own account, uh, once you've entered your details, you'll receive an email with a link to verify your identity. And once you're all ready to go, you click Create New Evaluation. Now, um, on this uh, program overview page, you need to answer some basic details about your program. I will create one here for our STEM careers programs for kids called Future U Australia, which is a national program funded by the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science and Resources. You also enter a short description of your program and then you're ready to start the five step process of evaluation, which is based on the framework uh, from the evaluation guide published a couple years ago. So the define stage sets the scene for your program. It prompts you to define your goals first. What do you want to achieve with your program? And all you need to do is select the options that apply to your program from the drop down menus. So we used the Women in STEM Decadal Plan and then a thorough literature review, and we came up with a list of the goals for you to choose from. So whichever ones apply to your program, um, make sure you're, you keep it focused. Three to five goals is probably good. You don't want to you know, have 10 to 15 goals. You can always also just put some extra detail in the text box if you need to. Next, you're prompted to identify the overarching problem that your program addresses. So the options displayed in this drop-down menu only relate to the goals you selected above. So some drop down menus you will see throughout are dependent on the previous choices that you make. Next, you'll define your program audiences. So that's the audience. Who is your program for? In our case, Future U is for um, students. So primary and we say middle school. So years seven and eight, um, as well as their parents and carers and um, teachers and educators. You'll also need to define your evaluation audiences. And those are the people who are interested in your evaluation findings. In our case for Future U, that's government and policymakers, um, the parents, but also our sponsors and um, teachers and educators. Now you'll see some relevant resources here at the bottom, like the National Evaluation Guide. So you can access those. Now onto the plan stage, which builds on the previous stage. Here you'll identify your program activities. In our, in our case, that's uh, comms, developing resources, um, our future U website, and also some uh, fun events. 
then you will uh, you can always of course put more detail in the text box uh, to kind of elaborate on those then um, you will identify your input so what is needed to make your program happen funding staff um, you know materials contractors anything like that You'll also identify your outputs. So here you can um, see, you might see some, some metrics like number of people, number of views. Those are outputs. They're not the measures of success, which is what we typically think evaluation is. But here your evaluation will measure the change you want to create. So you will be reporting on outputs eventually, and we'll get to that. But most importantly, you'll be measuring change. So. You'll next be prompted to identify your evaluation priorities and the key questions that you want your evaluation to answer. And those will those two things relate to each other. And next, <laughs> and next you will identify your indicators. Now, those are the markers that demonstrate the change you're trying to create. Now, it might sound daunting, but it's not because we did the work for you. So you can see there that the goals you um, selected previously are already there. And we uh, have identified what are the relevant indicators for those goals that you've previously selected. So there you have it. You've identified how you're going to measure your goals. And let's move on to the design stage. So here, You'll, design, you'll decide what data collection tools you will use. And again, that might be daunting, but we've made it, made it as easy as possible. So the indicators you selected are already there. And the drop-down menus show you the, um, the re reputable tools um, that relate to those indicators. In our case for Future U, we've opted to go with um, the Youth Insights Survey. Um, for parents, for students, and you'll see later on for teachers. So here you can view uh, the survey, all of the information, all of the survey questions are there and they're available by indicator. So depending on the indicators that you need to measure, it's all there ready for you to kind of use and, and pull those questions. So we've used the Youth Insights Survey for students and for parents. For the um, educators, uh, related indicator. We're also using the Youth Insights Survey for teachers and career advisors. Um, and for STEM identity, to measure STEM identity, we are using the um, Role STEM Identity Survey. So again, you can see here um, when I click on it, uh, all the information, citation, the validity and reliability measures if you need them and all of the questions that relate to those indicators. So in our case for Future U, those top ones are the ones that we're going to be looking to use. So now that you have your data collection measures, you will be prompted to think about your evaluation approach. So for Future U, we'll be using a pretest, post-test, which means that we will be serving people before they engage with Future U, and then again after they engage with Future U. You can always put a little bit more detail just to make things easier for those who are reading your evaluation. In terms of data collection method, uh, we are using mixed methods. So we'll be collecting quantitative data, that's numbers like from Likert scales, but also qualitative data in the form of open-ended responses to our open-ended questions in our survey. And finally, you will be prompted to think about how you will safeguard your data. So how, what kind of data are you collecting? Um, how will you store it? Who has access to it? And also, uh, how long will you store your data for? So in our case, we will store the data for seven years. 
Now, with your program and evaluation planned and designed, it's time for you to put it into action and execute. Now, this step also guides you through how to ethically carry out your evaluation. In our case, we will be recruiting participants, but that's not always the case. So here we provide how uh, we will invite the participants and how we will get informed consent. And yes, we will be following the consent requirements outlined in the National Statement of Ethical Conduct. Um, if you plan to publish your evaluation findings in an academic journal, you will need approval from a Human Research Ethics Committee. We plan to do that, so we got approval. Don't worry, you may, mo most of uh, you watching today will probably not uh, need to, you know, that's not your goal, and so you can just select no to that um, if you don't plan to publish in an academic journal. You're also prompted to provide some information about how you plan to analyze uh, your data and interpret those findings. Um, so there's some options there, and you can also just provide more detail if, um, if you need to. Finally, it is time to share. So this is the most important step, in my opinion. Here you can report on your findings of your valuation, reflect on what worked, what didn't, and how to improve programs. So if you don't have evaluation findings yet, select no, and you can come back later down the track when you do have the findings. If you do have um, collected and analyzed your, your data and you have your, your findings, select yes. You'll be prompted to complete the reporting section, fill out the key findings for each of the indicators that you selected in the plan stage, um, provide details on those program outputs, so those, those numbers that we spoke about earlier, but more importantly, the outcomes for each indicator, um, intended, unintended benefits and consequences, lessons learned, recommendations, it's all there. Now for future you, we're in the process of collecting data, so I'll just select no, um, and I'll come back and fill those things in later when we have results. You can upload any supplementary materials to include in your evaluation, like survey questions. Um, if you're finished your evaluation and your organization produced a nice shiny formal report, you can upload it here. You can export a PDF of your evaluation to keep in your files or share with others. So there's the PDF, there's everything that I've just filled in, um, and I can save that to my computer. And then you can publish your evaluation on the portal for others to learn from. Even if you don't have evaluation findings yet, which is the case here, you can publish your evaluation plan on the portal. This way, people can find your program, learn about what you're doing, how you're measuring your goals. It just brings that accountability and visibility and transparency that we've been talking about to your program, even if it's not complete yet. Your evaluations will then be on your dashboard. Um, you can unpublish or edit them at any point if you need. You can add collaborators who will work on these evaluations with you. Um, so I'll add my colleague Becky to this evaluation. And uh, then if you take a look at who is scrolled down and um, you can see that Becky has been added to my team as well. And that always just depends on, you can add different people to different evaluations. We go back to the search feature. You can see that Future You Australia is there published for everyone to see. It's displayed as in progress to indicate that we are still working on it. Um, and there you have it, the portal, a simple tool to help us evaluate and share our findings. <laughs> So I know that that was a very quick um, tour and demonstration. Now I invite some questions from uh, everyone who is here today. Now uh, let me just see. I know that my wonderful colleague Becky has been sending me questions. So the first question we have here is, 
Many programs use vanity metrics such as social media reach, number of people spoken to when um, talking to a large audiences, etc. These vanity metrics, whilst they look good on stakeholder reports with big numbers, don't tell the story of impact behavioral change, etc. Does the portal preference quality data over vanity metrics? Yes, absolutely. So um, again, when we were talking about those vanity metrics are outputs number of people attending, number of workshops, um, numbers of views on a website, those are outputs and they are important and we do want to report on them, but they do not tell the story of the change, the impact that your program has created. And um, as you can probably see from the demonstration I just gave, the evaluation portal absolutely focuses on the change you intend to create, how you measure those specific goals, those changes that you want to see, and then reporting on those specific indicators. So it's very much outcomes-based evaluation and not vanity metrics-based evaluations. So hopefully we will actually get um, an idea of the impacts of, of programs and not just you know, the, the common bums on seat kind of uh, metrics. Uh, we have a lot of questions about whether or not we are recording. Oh, so yes, we are recording this. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we are recording this session. So this will be available um, on our Women in STEM Ambassador channels. So um, just in, in maybe a couple of days, we'll post those and um, this will be available. You can see the demonstration again if you need to uh, follow along. Next question is about is there any longer term intent to use the evaluation portals evaluation data to compile national data to try to understand what many hundreds of programs are achieving in aggregate or in more detail over time? Excellent question. We hope so. Um, so we absolutely would love to do that. And this is, um, I mean, this is obviously ready to go, ready to use but it will continuously improve. We will continuously try to um, work and expand this, um, this resource. And one of the things that we definitely want to do is uh, create, a, you know, compile the, those national data uh, in aggregate so that we understand, you know, what is the collective impact of these programs. But, Another resource that does that beautifully and already exists is the Department of Industry um, has the STEM Equity Monitor. So the STEM Equity Monitor collects national data and compiles it into one place um, and it looks at four main categories. So school data, um, tertiary, so higher education data, uh, the translation from education to workplace, which they call graduate outcomes, and workforce data. So everything is there, and that's really our um, our tracker. You know, that's where we can go to see if that dial is shifting towards uh, closer towards equity. So that already exists, but we hope that the portal can kind of be integrated into that kind of measure, like the STEM Equity Monitor. Um, just wondering if we would need ethics approval from our university prior to using this tool. So great question. Um, if you plan to, so I actually um, spoke to, so we're at the University of New South Wales and I spoke to the ethics committee there about how, um, like the need for ethics. So um, they basically said that if you are planning to uh, publish your findings in an academic journal, you absolutely need to have ethics approval. If you're not in a university, that's a little bit trickier 
Uh, so maybe you can partner with a university that's doing something similar so that you can um, get that ethics approval. But if you're just evaluating and you don't plan on actually publishing this in an academic journal, then you do not need ethics approval. So that's the recommendation that I've been giving from, um, from our university. It's always good to double check with your own university wherever you are just to make sure. But uh, usually if it's just for evaluation purposes and not for academic publication, you don't need human ethics approval. Uh, so we are very close to uh, the end of our session. I think I've got Time for one more question. And they're quite long. Who will have access to evaluation tools? In some cases, there are sensitive questions, either in the surveys or interviews. If a family member or partner knows a woman participates in a survey and knows. Yes, OK, so there are some sensitivities to, um, to some of these data. Uh, as uh, so you don't have to you don't have to share your evaluation questions your survey questions if you don't want to or if it's sensitive you can you can keep that um, uh, private uh, also in the share stage where you saw um, down that we have the capability the feature to download a PDF and to um, publish to the repository you can there are toggles that you can turn on and off for visibility so if there's anything in your evaluation in one of the sections that's uh, um, sensitive you can turn that off and what it will do is it will publish everything except for those those parts and it will just say these these are not available um, publicly so we absolutely understand that you know there are some sensitivities there are some sensitive questions there's sensitive data um, there may be some sensitive findings and so um, you kind of have that control of what you publish publicly or not all right so this takes us to the end of our session today i want to end by thanking our guests, uh, the Honorable Ed Husick, MP, Minister for Industry and Science, Anna Maria Arabia, um, Wafa El Adami, and Lisa, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the Commonwealth Department of Industry, um, Science and Resources for funding this project, our friends and colleagues at ASG, and everyone who has been involved in creating the portal. And finally, thank you for joining us today for the launch. I encourage you to visit uh, the portal evaluation.womeninstem.org.au. Uh, visit the portal, create an account, build your evaluation, and publish it. If we're going to create change, then we need to know if our actions are working. So thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing your evaluation on the portal.